Now I want to welcome everyone to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's next to last program in our uh, winter speaker series. As I said, spring is right around the corner. If you are a visitor and this is your first time visiting the Athenaeum, we look forward to being able to welcome you in person in the future. We are a community of people who love learning, who are intellectually curious, who care about our world, about our city, about history and literature and the built environment, and who love to be in conversation together about all of these things. And it is so wonderful that we're able to continue our speaker series even during this pandemic time so that we can continue to learn and engage together. I love to receive the emails and, and calls from people about what has moved them from uh, uh, our various speakers. I want to remind you that if you want to get the most out of this, you want to go up to the upper right hand corner of your screen if you have a laptop or computer and make sure that your, your thing clicks on uh, speaker view. It can be gallery view or speaker view. If you go speaker view, <coughs> that will give you the view of our speaker and not of Tess and me while she is talking. The bottom of our screen is the Q&A and the chat. Please use the chat to send out your um, high fives and your um, congratulations and appreciation to our speaker. Um, the Q&A is the perfect place to leave questions anytime during this talk, which I will moderate during the Q&A time. Now, it's really wonderful to introduce tonight's speaker, who we just realized um, she finished her doctorate where I got my, my, my MA at, at Binghamton University, and we share that in common. Stephanie McCurry uh, uh, brings to her most recent book, Women's War, Fighting and Surviving the American Civil War, her own experiences growing up in Belfast during the Troubles um, in a, a profound way and helped shape her understanding of the Civil War. She is an accomplished scholar whose, uh, whose books have taken the idea of the political and expanded it from traditional history to look at personal lives and the personal realm to take into account gender and, and race in her work to push the boundaries. Um, this includes in her book, Masters of Small Worlds, Yeoman Households and Gender Relations, and political culture uh, in the antebellum South Carolina Low Country. That was a long title. <laughs> that wasn't in the dissertation to the book, <laughs> but it it won the John Hope uh, Franklin Prize and four other awards. And then her uh, second book was Confederate Reckoning: Race and Politics in the Civil War South, which was a finalist for the uh, Pulitzer Prize and winner of the Frederick Douglass Prize, the Merle Curdy Prize, and the Avery O. Craven Award and the Willie Lee Rose Prize. Her most recent book, as I said, is Women's War. It is a fabulous book. I am nearly through it and, and finding it riveting and helpful and thought provoking as she pulls in not only her own prodigious research, but also careful view of the most recent scholarship that has been coming out about the Civil War, about slavery, about gender that all pushes boundaries and, and, and um, longstanding understandings of, uh, for historians and, and the public on how we look at, at these various events. She is currently the R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of History in honor of Dwight D. Eisenhower at Columbia University. And we are honored to have you here today, Dr. McCurry. I invite everyone to give with me a virtual welcome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I am uh, really delighted to be here tonight with the Philly Athenaeum. And normally I would be bemoaning the fact that it's on Zoom and not in person, but actually I have a really, really bad cold. So today I'm very grateful for Zoom because I can give you the talk without sharing my horrendous load of, uh, of germs here. Um, so uh, as Beth said, uh, I just finished this book in 2019, just before the pandemic hit. Um, and I thought I'd begin tonight, just as actually she mentioned, by talking a bit about why I wrote this book and about its intellectual commitments. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a quick account of its three parts. So I think the talk overall is about 40 minutes or maybe a little bit less. Um, so I'm a historian of the 19th century United States, the South, the Civil War and Emancipation. Um, and I write about all of those things, but underneath it all, for me, there is really only ever one topic and that's relations of power between human beings and how they work in past times. War, violence, politics, legitimacy, these are the uh, kind of subjects that preoccupy me. And power between men and women, uh, which is something integral to the rest, but far harder to explain and much less well understood. 
Um, I have written about these things in many ways over the years, but in every case, I kept a distance uh, from the historical experience that produced the scholar. I didn't reflect on that. Uh, and this book, Women's War, is really close to my heart for that reason, because it's really the first time I faced this head on and tried to articulate, including to myself, but also to my readers, um, the connection between my personal and scholarly selves. So in other words, I tried to turn the historian's lens a little bit on myself and look at myself in my own times and to excavate and explain the things that matter to me in the writing of history. So I mean really simple things like that about by that. I mean, like, why do I choose the subjects I do? These are questions I ask myself. I could write about anything. Why do I choose the subjects I do? Why do I write about them the way I do? Why do I care so much about gender and power, about not writing women out of the history that, to my mind, they so obviously made? And that has a lot to do, those questions have a lot to do with why I would write a book like this. Um, you know, as Beth mentioned, one really salient biographical fact is that even though I do American history, I'm not American. I grew up in Belfast during the Troubles uh, on the Catholic side of the line in a city that was under British military occupation. And it was a really, really interesting place. I mean, it offered its own education, uh, the kind you get in the streets. And especially about what happens when people don't have the political power to make change by democratic means. Um, and when they turn to violence to force change and about the limits of human agency uh, when they do that. I mean, growing up the way I did, you learn a lot about the frailty of the human body and um, about political struggle and the costs of it. But I learned other things in that place when I was a kid, uh, also about whose struggle it was. And that's one of the central questions uh, Women's War takes on. Mine was a nationalist Irish community dominated by men, but there was no doubt in any, anyone's minds in the neighborhoods and in the community about women's involvement in the movement. And so all of that stayed with me, including the knowledge common in many parts of the world that have been through struggles like this or wars, that women are passionate parties to their people's struggles. They aren't indifferent, uh, they aren't outside politics. They don't just wait for things to resolve. It's their fight too, for better or for worse. So I can't really recognize histories of war that leave women out. And certainly I would never write one. And in the other two books that I've written before, women are central actors, but I have never, and mostly about politics, about women and political struggle. But here I wanted to write about the civil war as a military struggle and one that women uh, were also part of which is a subject that is not that easy to, to address. Um, so women's war is about the American Civil War. But what I'm trying to say to you here to start with is that it's also about what I think of as the meta problem of women in war, which is what I see as the transhistorical and highly problematic assumption that women are outside war. And this is an idea that is at least as old as Sophocles' fifth century play, Antigone. Um, you might think of the, if you know the play, then I think you can recognize the idea that women, she, Antigone, belongs to the realm of the family or kinship, not citizenship, to the household, not the polity, to the family, not the government or the state, and peace, not war. She has no stakes in the war, only in the honoring of her family obligations to her brothers. Seen this way, women as outside war, women might be witnesses to war. Most often they are characterized as victims of war or innocent parties who should be protected in it. But not just human beings and political subjects like, like men who share convictions about the causes of the war or the legitimacy of invasions who are willing to fight or to shape the terms of war simply as a lot of men do, simply in their desperation to survive it. So I see this Antigone idea as a powerful transcultural and transhistorical idea in Western civilization. And it undergirds the powerful association of gender and innocence in war, which you can see most importantly in the identification of women, say, as the essential non-combatants in war. 
But the idea of women's innocence, by their nature, they are innocent in their identity as mothers, as wives. This uh, idea of women's innocence is actually at odds with the direction of modern people's wars, uh, like the American Civil War, of which there were many in the 19th century, and also with the direction more lethally of the kind of total wars that we entered into in the 20th century. So in these wars, you can't really draw the same distinctions between a home front and a battlefront combatants and non-combatants. These distinctions are extremely hard to maintain, but I think in ways that we haven't really grappled with, this was true before, even before there were a million Soviet women in tanks and military positions. So this is a belief, this idea of women outside war, what I'm trying to suggest is even though we deeply believe it and everything tells us to believe it, it's actually a belief belied by a long history. And the evidence is everywhere you look, once you look for it, scattered amidst the histories of all kinds of individual conflicts. You can see it across the sweep of modern history in civil wars, in world wars, and wars of national liberation. Um, but the pattern gets lost and every case gets cast as an exception to that rule. And that's the way other historians often, especially male historians, often talk to me about this. If I ask them, were there women's units fighting in the Italian War of Independence? They say, oh yeah, there was this group of women, they were called X, but you know, there was only a, a handful of them. So everybody will tell you a story, but nobody, everybody thinks that it's just a one-off, an exceptional case. So the pattern is lost and every case cast as an exception to the rule. Um, in fact, it would take a, an army of historians to assemble the evidence and to make the case uh, across modern history. When it comes to the American Civil War, that fiction that women are outside war is a powerful one. And it shaped both the war itself and the way we write about it, including how we still write about it. It can be encapsulated in the idea as one Union soldier put it, that we do not make war on women and children. Women, he said, are entitled to protection even if they are the wives and daughters of rebels. So that was a belief internalized even by ordinary soldiers. Um, and there is, I think we need to recognize and be respectful of the fact that there's a great deal at stake in that idea. It represents an investment in the gender order itself Okay, think about marriage and the family and the so natural asymmetries that are allegedly required to maintain that. So the gender order, which everybody has an investment in. But it's also uh, the other idea that's at stake uh, uh, is the desire to limit the destructiveness of war. And here what I mean is that thinking of women as not the enemy, as innocent parties, limits the boundaries and scope of war. Can you imagine if every possible person, man, woman, child was equally threatening? Then what you have is no home front and battle front, no limits at all. And I do think that embedded in the international laws of war and this idea of women as non-combatants is a commitment to limiting the destructiveness of war. Um, it helps explain the deep reluctance of soldiers to confront the role of enemy women when the war is ongoing. And I'll tell you something about that. And the need to forget or deny what women have done in wars when the war is over. And um, the historian Isabel Hull has said that there's no glory for any soldiers in fighting women. They don't want to acknowledge that they had to fight women. Um, and yet in every war that I know of, at least in the modern period, and as I demonstrate here with respect to the American Civil War, governments and armies are always forced to acknowledge women's roles as enemies who matter during the conflict, which is to say in the midst of the conflict. But when it's over, the whole society moves forcefully to deny it and to bury that disturbing history and knowledge, which is part of the reason we inherit these heroic narratives of war that don't that have women positioned only as victims uh, in it. And um, one Indian historian has said, uh, you can't include women because it messes up the plot. And the plot is a heroic plot. You can imagine heroic narratives of war, where do women fit? They fit as the keepers of the, hear the hearth and the fire at home, or as nurses mitigating, uh, mitigating and uh, playing, the, playing the same traditional roles they play in peacetime at home for the army. That, so we have huge numbers of books about the sanitary commission, for example, 
which is a fantastic subject, but it's only one subject. It's a more comfortable subject. Um, so my book is about that. It's about the meta problem of women in war. And that's why uh, I have that title. It's not just about the American Civil War. To me, it's about women's war and what happens when women fight wars. And it's why it mattered to me to write it, to tackle fictions about women in war, to challenge the writing out of women, including by historians, and to insist on the value of women's perspective on wars and their aftermath. So that's the big sort of architecture. That's the me part of the book. Why did I write it? What's it about? Historians always work on smaller iterations of topics that are that are big. And for me, the big issue is this problem of women in war. So let me tell you about how I tried to bring that to life and not just make you know uh, claims about it uh, in the different parts of the book. My attempt to show that the challenges that issued from women's participation in the American Civil War were fundamental, not incidental parts of that war in the United States. <clears throat> so the book has three parts and each takes up a central question of Civil War history that I argue turns uh, crucially on the history of women and gender. The first chapter is called Enemy Women and the Laws of War, and it's about the nature of the military conflict itself and the new American, uh, the new destructive uh, so-called American way of waging war, which is about overwhelming your enemy uh, with material and men and fighting to a definitive conclusion definitive victory. Um, the second is called the story of the black of black soldiers wives. And it's about black women fugitives runaway slave women's role in the process of slave emancipation. And it's also about the limits of the military story we currently tell about what emancipation was in the United States. And the third chapter is called reconstructing a life amid the ruins. And it's about the challenges of reconstructing a post war order and the scale of that task, what was actually involved in destroying slavery and reconstructing what is what was really in effect a new society in the aftermath of the war. So let me then let me tell you about this first chapter uh, now. <clears throat> so enemy women and the laws of war is a deep dive into international law and the idea of gender and innocence in the laws of war. The assumption of women's innocence is the fundamental basis or has been the fundamental basis of some civilian immunity in the laws of war since the 16th century, although it's something scholars never point out. There's no gender analysis. It took a serious hit during the American Civil War, this idea of women's innocence and civilian immunity in a new code of law written in the middle of the war to govern the conduct of the Union armies in the field. It was named after a man, Francis Lieber, German born, a uh, Columbia law professor who was commissioned by the Lincoln administration to write it and to address a whole series of problems that the army was facing by the end of 1862. Lieber's code was highly influential and it became the basis of the Hague and Geneva conventions. So this is one thing about the American Civil War that lasted and shaped other wars. It was commissioned, as I mentioned, to solve a number of pressing issues one was slave emancipation, because as the, uh, as, as the army started to enlist, the Union Army started to enlist black men, they faced very challenging issues about black prisoners of war, among other things. Um, but it was also commissioned to solve a solution to the problem of war in the border states, the classic people's war of resistance against an army of invasion or occupation. So in other words, in the border states, Tennessee, Missouri, as the Union Army moved in and met Confederate resistance and became an army of invasion and occupation, um, they faced not just the regular units of the Confederate Army, but all these guerrilla units and partisan forces that did not wear uniforms, were not under the regular uh, rule of the army. Um, and the army is fighting this people, this is the people's war, the people rising in, re in resistance to invasion. Um, and it's a pro-Confederate, these are pro-Confederate guerrilla units operating in conjunction with regular Confederate army units. Um, so the Union Army in these places is completely overwhelmed and they're finding themselves fighting Confederate guerrilla bands and partisans, civilians engaged in what they regarded as treason, 
and deadly military activity, but they have no means of uh, punishing them or controlling them. And the military reports from the army in these places are littered with references to women in these guerrilla bands and in these partisan units, luring soldiers into ambushes and shooting them, cutting telegraph wires and other acts of sabotage, spying, conveying intelligence, breaking men, uh, uh, Confederate prisoners of war out of Union prisons, the sort of underground work that women do in partisan forces across the modern period. So in 1863, Lieber writes this code. Um, and as I said, it's widely recognized as a radical revision of the laws of war, a complete break with the Enlightenment tradition, and really incorporating the post-Napoleonic age of people's war and pointing forward in very important ways towards the kind of modern war that we would see in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And in, as, as legal historians look at it, they say that in no area was the code more significant than its meaning for the distinction between combatants and civilians on which the law of war is based. So in the er, analysis and history of the law of war, people talk about the distinction. It's the central thing that the law is focused around. And it is about the distinction between the combatant and what you can do to them and the non-combatant or the civilian and the immunity that they are guaranteed under the laws of war. With Lieber in this new code uh, written in uh, 1863, in the middle of 1863, the protections accorded civilians in war are eroded, even eviscerated really, and the balance between immunity and accountability shifts radically towards accountability. John Witt, the historian at Yale, has called it the, uh, no, sorry, it wasn't John Witt. One of the earlier historians called it the arch occupier's code. So in other words, they were, they were legitimizing the kind of acts, including of violence, that they would need to take against these civilians uh, as an army of occupation. They gave themselves the legitimate right to do it. Um, and this is why it still matters. It's uh, still highly relevant uh, in war. Now, this is, this is known about Lieber's code, but my chapter about women is based on an archival discovery. Because when I went to the Huntington Library, because I knew they held a first draft of Lieber's code, what I discovered is that the most important section of the code, section four, where the distinction is eroded, that it wasn't in the first draft. It was added afterwards at the demand of General in Chief Henry Halleck, and it incorporated on Halleck's orders and virtually ver verbatim a set of military field orders Halleck had issued in 1863, specifically in response to the military threat posed by enemy women, Confederate women in Tennessee. By the time Halleck issued his crackdown in February of 63, early March of 1863, uh, large numbers of women had already, Confederate women, rebel women, had already been arrested and imprisoned. The army had no legitimate right to imprison them. This is why they needed the code to say, you're not gonna be court-martialed for this. Um, and Halleck's orders authorized that just as a military order on the grounds that their actions constituted military treason. This was a new thing. There's treason in the American constitution. It's incredibly hard to prove. Military treason is a very specific thing with a different set of proofs and definitions. And these, this military treason and women's accountability for it were incorporated into Lieber's code on the direct command of Henry Halleck. So that's interesting right there. All these people who have written about this all their lives not only don't realize that this wasn't in the code to start with, they don't realize that it was put in there to deal with the problem the army was having with rebel women. It's precisely these parts of the Lieber's code that scholars still point to as the most important part, but none of them appear to have any idea of the women's history connected to it and that in fact prompted it. What had collapsed in the American Civil War, what's the story here, is that what had collapsed in the American Civil War was the assumption of women's innocence on which the distinction and the identity of the civilian or non-combatant was and is premised. It has had its roots in the struggle of the Union Army with enemy women, and it had a long life in Lieber's Code and in the Hague and Geneva Conventions following. It is a Civil War women's history obscured but still manifest and enduring in the laws of war. 
So in many ways, I was excavating this buried history that women were at the center of uh, about an issue that everyone recognizes the American Civil War was crucial, not just in the United States, but in the Western world. In the epilogue to the book, I look at the denial of this knowledge, the erasure and silencing that came after the American Civil War, and as I mentioned at the beginning, comes pretty predictably after every war. And I, in, the, in the epilogue, I draw out the contemporary significance of the idea of women's innocence and civilian immunity, their entitlement to protection, which has been rehabilitated by the United Nations and other international agencies since World War II, where it was basically shattered. It's been constantly rehabilitated. You can see the need that they have for it. And the most recent attempt to rehabilitate it is in the UN resolutions on women, peace and security passed in the year 2000, just one of the ongoing attempts in the aftermath of the wars in Bosnia and Rwanda to restore or re rehabilitate the idea of women's innocence as the necessary underpinning of civilian immunity in war. In other words, if you don't have that, how can you have civilian protections? So it falls apart during the war. The armies need a way to hold women accountable. As soon as it's over, they all forget it ever happened. Uh, Lieber included. He was really unbelievable on this. Uh, he, he denied anything about women in the Civil War, even he, though he had written the code, because he was pissed off about New York women trying to get the right to vote in 1868 or 70. So he, he came out. In fact, probably in Philadelphia, gave a bunch of talks at the Union Leagues about women's role as sacrificial, you know, uh, it was, it, it's crazy. Anyway, right about that. Um, so the second chapter of the book turns to the question uh, of another defining feature of the American Civil War, which is the process of slave emancipation. And it challenges and engages, and in some ways challenges, the now dominant narrative that slaves earned emancipation through military service which when you think about it, that's the story we tell. Lincoln didn't free the slaves, the free slaves freed themselves by their military service. If you think about this for a second, you see the problem. It's an obviously male narrative. Okay, who can fight for the Union Army? And it's a flawed or at least highly partial one. About 4 million people were enslaved in the United States in 1860. About 200,000 men, African-American men served in the Union military. Slaves fight for freedom and their way of waging the war against the Confederacy in aid of the Union, but also most importantly in pursuit of their own freedom was only ever partially aligned with the Union war effort. It was aligned in some ways, but it wasn't exclusively aligned with that. And so my chapter focuses on that larger story of the fight for emancipation and the very different war African-American women were fighting to destroy slavery and find a way to liberate themselves and their families while somehow also surviving the military conflict. And this is a story that fits no state or government narrative, Union or Confederate. It is not centered in the archives. It is, is not easy to unearth. And it has been entirely neglected in both literatures on the Union and on the Confederacy. Um, what I try to show is that the, ch is the challenges that black women fugitives, enslaved women who ran away to the sphere of control of the Union Army, like men did, um, that they faced an even more forbidding landscape than the men in their families and communities, in no small part because from the point of view of the Union Army, there was no military upside to their presence. They were seen as a burden and an encumbrance, and that's the way they show up in the, in the military records. The thousands, even hundreds of thousands of women and children who flooded into union lines created a humanitarian crisis of staggering proportions, but also a problem of governance that confounded and shaped union policies, in union military policy, in emancipation policy, I should say, in ways that I don't think we've really grappled with. From the beginning of the war, you might, as you might know, the Union Army and the government justified what they called the confiscation of male slaves as a military necessity. They weren't going to let the Confederate masters use them. It was a justifiable act of war to confiscate property. Um, and they justified this as a military necessity. This logic would not work for women. 
the Confederate army didn't impress women, et cetera, et cetera. And so they construed the slaves in rebellion as male from the very get-go, and the women fugitives who they were daily confronted with as those men's wives, whether they were or not. Um, so facing the limits of their own logic and their own policy, we have a right to hold men because they might be used to aid the military. They just sort of grandfathered the women in as the wives. Um, and so the government response was to treat every woman in the lines as if she was a particular black laborer's wife or later a, a black soldier's wife. Now the ironies of this abound. Marriage was not legal for enslaved people. Even if people were effectively married, they had no legal claim to one another. Um, and in fact, and, and in addition, many, many women came into union lines as heads of households themselves or with groups of people in, in their extended kinship networks. Um, some were married, some were not. Um, the policy was really designed to manage the problem of emancipation that is to say the hundreds of thousands of nominally free people uh, now dependent on the government for relief. So in the first instance, is this, in many ways, it was a response to what was experienced as a welfare problem. Um, and interestingly enough, it's not only in the United States that you see this, it happens across the American hemisphere in the process of slave emancipation, starting with Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century, the repeated recourse to marriage as an organizing principle of state-sponsored emancipations. When governments are involved, they want men to be in charge of women and the heads of organized families. They don't want to deal with women as a bunch of individuals with their own you know, objectives. And you see that for policymakers, in fact, not just in the United States, but in general, emancipation is inconceivable without the prior and anchoring order of marriage and the patriarchal family. And in the American Civil War, that marriage policy gave little support or protection to African American women. I mean, it did allow the Union, the, in, in an important way it did, because it allowed the Union Army to refuse to return them to their owners. So it gave them the right to stay, um, but a very little other kind of protection. And in fact, many, many officers tried to drive the women and children out of their camps and out of their lines. And there was a, there's enormous inhumanity in the experiences that are recorded in the military records. Um, so it gives little support or protection to them at the time. And I think it really shows how few allies Black women had, including among human, union forces, and how much they were up against in every respect in their war. And yet you see the determination, the decisions they made, the risks they took. Uh, in the South, leaving the Confederate South, uh, highly risky um, uh, moves to aid the Union Army, prisoners of war, to be spies, but also just to get their families away, their children away, themselves away. The human cost was staggeringly high. It's hard to grasp it now, but in the book I try to show how exposed and vulnerable each of these women was to deadly violence at the hand of white Southerners, at the hands of white Southerners, and both armies. It's shocking even now to realize that in all the accounting for the Civil War dead, including Drew Faust's wonderful book, This Republic of Suffering, we have no idea how many enslaved people were murdered or died in the conflict. We still do not have a body count. The fiction that every black woman fighting the Civil War was a soldier's wife offered the women themselves little protection during the conflict. But we have to remember that it did set the conditions of the citizenship they could claim afterwards and establish them as dependent parties or minors in the drama of emancipation, which is where they still stay. If men earned emancipation by military service, these policies made it look like the women got emancipation because of the military service of their men. So this is a comfortable narrative, but it's not a very good one. Um, and this is still how the history is written. From my point of view, another group of women key to the history of the Civil War wiped out of the history they made. So <clears throat> the last part of the book, and I should be done pretty soon, 
is called Reconstructing a Life Amid the Ruins. And I could talk about this all day because this is the thing that I continue to work on. So the beginning of the book was kind of a bridge from the Confederate uh, Reckoning book. And this chapter is a bridge into the big questions that I'm still working on now. So the last part of the book is about one white Southern formerly slave holding woman's effort at reconstructing a life in the ruins of the old South. Um, and uh, this woman is called Gertrude Thomas. She was from Augusta, Georgia. Uh, and to my ev everlasting uh, uh, benefit, she kept a 41 year record of her life. How many of you have done that? I, I, maybe a few, um, but it captured the absolutely enormous historical passage between the slave South to the uh, post-emancipation, post-Civil War South. She started keeping it in the early 1850s when she was a teenager and a belle and courting and going to, she actually went to college, believe it or not, uh, and then um, uh, all the way down to the 1890s. So it's an amazing record. And the fact that it's a woman's perspective on history is what makes it valuable. I am adamant about this because it necessarily takes in the impact of social collapse and post-war reconstruction in personal as well as political realms. And so it allows us to see how the things we already know about that we're constantly reading about, how huge structural changes in land, labor, capital, racial ideology, how these were inextricably entangled with highly intimate personal matters of marriage and family, sexuality, and even love with slavery and its possessive claim destroyed, even subjectivity itself and ideas of love and belonging had to be remade. Now there's been a great deal written over the years about reconstruction and we get new documentaries all the time. There's one I think just recently came out, but crazy as it sounds, I think we still haven't taken the proper measure of what emancipation and thus the process of reconstructing involved. And one shift I made in my own mind is to stop talking about reconstruction and start thinking about reconstructing. What are the processes involved in making peace and establishing order in the aftermath of a brutal and divisive civil war? And in this case, one that emancipated 4 million people. Uh, so um, I think we need to grasp this process, this passage, not just at the global and economic levels in terms, for example, of international and national capital flows, land and labor, political economy, but to me, especially what is missing is our grasp of it on a human scale. It's the human experience of meta events that interests me now. What I want to write about is how people lived through this. Um, Gertrude Thomas lost everything. She was born the daughter of one of the richest men in Georgia, over the course of the 30 year period after the Civil War, she went from wealth to utter poverty because the vast majority of that wealth that she and her father had owned had been in the form of enslaved people, black men, women and children, as many as 400 human beings, her father and eventually she and her husband had owned before that they were liberated. So reconstruction is this process of defeat, uh, uh, for, and, and, and dispossession for Confederates, confiscation. But the same, uh, the same experience is an experience of liberation, of, of, of success and liberation for other people of the South. Um, now, for Gertrude Thomas, Reconstruction, if you read her diary, it's clear that Reconstruction proved even harder to survive than war. It was more difficult for her. For her, Reconstruction was more like deconstruction a relentless process of loss, subtraction, and diminution in wealth and class standing, and as she feared desperately, racial distinction. She worried so much about her sons, her children. If they were not educated and wealthy, then what would distinguish them from African-American sons rising uh, through education and opportunity? And she was determined to preserve their distinction, and to her, it was a racial distinction. The chapter tells the story of her attempt at reconstructing a life. First in, first part of the chapter is about uh, it in relation to the family, the household, love and belonging, then in relation to her efforts to make a living without enslaved labor. So land, labor and politics, which are inextricable, 
including the family's involvement in the violent white supremacist backlash of the first Ku Klux Klan, which her definitely her brother and probably her husband were involved in the clan, the local clan. The clan was in rampaged in the area around Augusta. And then another part of the chapter is about the relation to capital and debt. The question of debt is the predominating element of her post-war life. It's a, a lot about what the diary is about. And, in, and it involves both the reconfiguration of global and national capital, but also in ways we need to understand the constraints of married women's rights to control their property. Because even though right after the Civil War, women in, married women in Georgia got married women's property rights, but the culture of wifely religious submission meant very few were able to exercise those rights over the requests or demands of their husbands. So Gertrude Thomas owned most of the land and property that they had after slave emancipation. Uh, but when her husband asked her to sign it away to secure his debts, she could never say no. So they gradually lost everything because he was a terrible manager and she couldn't, um, she believed it was her, she was a very a devout Methodist and she really believed it was her wifely uh, role to, um, to submit to him and his, his wishes in this. And finally, the chapter is about racial ideology and the reconstruction of white supremacy on new post-slavery terms. People like Gertrude Thomas did not just accept the loss of their material and racial privilege or surrender uh, peacefully their possessive claim on the people they had owned. As everything was wrenched away, her response mixed grief, loss, and rage in dangerous measure. At the very moment she was living through defeat and emancipation, her father died. He died literally when Sherman's troops marched through Georgia and took her plantations. At that moment, her father died. And when his will was read, she learned that he had other children, enslaved children whose mother he had owned for a very long time. And the story I tell here, which is denied by her biographer and the editor of the published diary, but which is confirmed by new documents I found even since the book was published uh, in a, a court record in the summer of 1865, confirm that this woman was the mother of um, Gertrude Clanton Thomas's. She was the sexual partner and father of mother of children belonging to Gertrude's father. Gertrude had been afraid of this all her life. She kind of halfway knew it, but she never wanted to admit it. Um, and it is confirmed because that woman, Lorraine Clanton, as she called herself after the war, her, her uh, Ella Thomas's father was called um, uh, Clanton, that was his last name. Lorraine Clanton filed a paternity suit in Freedmen's Bureau Court in Augusta, Georgia in the summer of 1865, the day the court opened. So at the first moment that an, a formerly enslaved woman could hold a white man accountable for what had happened to her under slavery, she went into that court and she filed a complaint. Um, so let me just say, this is not an irrelevant part of the story. It's impossible to separate Gertrude Thomas's thinking about race and white supremacy from her feelings of sexual betrayal and humiliation. And one thing her story shows and her diary shows is that the damage from slavery set a deep explosive charge beneath every negotiation over the terms of freedom in the post-war South. This is one of the things, one of the things I believe we have not taken the proper measure of. I think we have fundamentally underestimated what emancipation really involved. Slavery had been the foundational institution of Southern life since the 17th century, and the end of it required the reconstruction of every element of life, not just those things out in the public world, but in, uh, in, inside the home and the family. Reconstruction involved a revolution in every household and every family in the American South, white and black. With slavery and its possessive claim destroyed, even subjectivity itself and ideas of love and belonging had to be remade. And once we recognize this, I think we get the possibilities of a new history of reconstruction, one that takes the proper measure and the deeper uh, elements of what this, uh, uh, what it meant to try to make a new society of free people on the basis of one that had been a slaveholding society. And I continue to, to work on this now, as I said, and I could talk about it all day long, but I'll leave it there. And I really look forward to your questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. This is fabulous. It's a it's a little dive into her book, which is so well written. And um, to say there, there's so many poignant and um, intense moments uh, that you bring out in the stories of, of individuals as well as as a whole, the, uh, the inhumanity, for example, of the, the 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 refugee camps and the way the women are pressed into labor on plantations when they were seeking freedom and protection um, during the war. Well, thank you. I invite you, if you have questions, to put them in the in the Q and A. Um, uh, first, K Carrie says, and maybe you want to speak about this. It's her understanding that abuses of Black women by Sherman's troops have been glossed over. Very much so. Uh, but I can direct you to a book written by the brilliant historian Savolia Glimp, um, which is called Women's Fight, I, I believe, which was published just last year. And one of the chapters of that book is an absolutely destroying account of the humanitarian crisis and women's um, existence in the rear of Sherman's army. And she used the military records and the pension records to reconstruct and follow particular individuals. So the recognition that the war involved a humanitarian crisis is something that has been coming on in recent years in the scholarship. People write about disease now and all kinds of things that they didn't write about too much before. But this, um, the Volia is the best historian of, of this uh, part of the story. And, um, it, you know, it's just makes for devastating reading. So I would really, I think we're in a better position than we were before. And I believe she, um, it's a chapter of this book, but I believe she's writing a much bigger a bigger uh, book on um, the Civil War and it's uh, the humanitarian crisis of refugee women and children. It really is huge. I, you know, I say my, you know, my earlier years of, 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 of study and looking at this period never brought to light for me the way your book did and Tavolia's work about, you know, thinking about Civil War as a, as a refugee crisis that, that I, I think many of us average folk have not thought about which we commonly um, think about for other wars, but right. not our own. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and for that, that's the price of admission for, for this book is, is to, 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 to read that. So uh, a Tess just put in uh, the, the book that she just mentioned, she just made put the link uh, to our bookshop.org site. You can, you can uh, check it out right there. Tavolia Glimp, um, another fantastic historian. Um, Francine asked, uh, don't women serve the role of chat chattel in wars and their aftermath? Could she say a little more about chattel, what she means by chattel? I mean, enslaved people are legally chattel property, but I think maybe she means something different. Yeah, so Francine, if you're still here, I want to want to put that. One thing that I didn't dwell on, because I don't exactly know what to say about it, is that one very traditional way that women appear, say, in plays about war is as booty of war, right? And all the classic plays that are hauled off as, as, uh, as the sort of loot of war. And it's possible that, that she's thinking about that. And that is true. I mean, the seizure of women uh, by male parties, like other forms of property, um, you know, we'd have to think about when and if that ever stopped. I mean, we maybe think it did because, you know, you, it comes to mind primarily in relation to the classical plays, like the Theban plays or something like that. Then you think about Rwanda or, uh, or the Yadzi women in Syria or, the, uh, or Bosnia, uh, um, the Bosnian Wars. So if that's what she has in mind, this is very much uh, it's a very important issue in, in feminist legal scholarship and, and, and uh, um, peace and security studies. Um, Jean asks, in your research, did you find diaries or journals of Black women who recorded their experiences during the war or in later, um, later recollections during Reconstruction? Well, um, yes and yes, but it's never in the same quantity or amount. There's always an asymmetry in the sources which you're fighting. And which was why I just thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I found this woman four lines about Lorraine e. Clanton bringing her case in, a, in an Augusta court um, in 1865. There are some memoirs and narratives of black women who served in the Union Army. As nurses, for example, um, Susie King Taylor's uh, 
her husband, she, she was from uh, low country, Georgia, maybe Savannah. And she ended up working as a nurse in one of the black regiments that I think was founded in Massachusetts, but uh, fought in, in Georgia. And she was paid as a laundress, but she worked as a nurse. So that tells you something right there. Her story is amazing. And it's a very small book. It's, um, it's mem memories of memoir of life in a black regiment or something like that. Susie King Taylor. That's, that's a really amazing uh, document. And there mm -hmm. are, um, there are all kinds of sources that you can use, but they tend not to be uh, long published diaries, such as Gertrude Thomas left. I mean, the first book I ever researched and wrote was on uh, poor whites in South Carolina, and I didn't have any sources for them either. I mean, um, so there's other ways to compensate for the lack of, um, uh, there, there, are, there are various things. There are black women from Philadelphia who went to serve in the refugee camps or the contraband camps as they were called in, uh, in Virginia, in South Carolina, there are various things. There are white missionary women who talk a lot about the black women they worked with and, and helped in those, uh, in those areas. Um, and then there's the military records like I use, the pension records. These are after the fact, but this is what the Volia used. Black women trying to get their husband's pension who have to explain more than the average white woman because they don't have a marriage license. They weren't allowed to marry. So they're explaining a lot about their family, their marriage. There's doctors, government records of claims that people, the government tried to pay back. Like say the Union Army invaded a plantation and ate up all the food. Some of that food was raised by, belonged to black enslaved people. After the war in the 1870s, they tried to pay those people back. And there's a lot of depositions with stories there that are fantastically interesting. So there's places to look, but there's not that equivalent letters, memoirs. Um, they're mostly in government documents, in newspapers. Um, there are exceptions, but it's a different kind of source base. In, in your book, uh, in, in, the, in the chapters you talk about, um, the, the challenge for black women who could only be seen as the wife of, of a black soldier, um, that you really expose the racism that was so apparent in, in, in much of the Union Army that um, soldiers in general, they were, they were apt to look at a, a woman who said, I'm, I'm, my, my husband's here, I'm coming to see him, or I'm, and say, no, you're a prostitute. You know, we don't want you in the camp. Uh, you wanna say a little bit about the kind of treatment that black women often receive when they were trying to seek protection. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's really awful because on the one hand, the army is insisting that they be identified as soldiers' wives. But if they try to claim the benefits of a soldier's wife, they have an extraordinarily difficult time. So part of like, it, this is not uncommon in, in, in wars, including the revolutionary wars, that poor women follow the army because they, they're, they're following their husband's paycheck. This is not, so you see this, for example, refugee camps often grow up around uh, army encampments because that's where black soldiers are and their family members are in these refugee camps basically around the army. And on payday, they show up basically at the fence looking for you know um, their husbands to get the money and they're driven away by the officers, white officers, because as we know until late, uh, there's very few black officers uh, um, in the in the black units, um, and yeah, they're just treated incredibly shabbily. But there's other things that happen, like you know, um, the women and children. For, they can be they can be they can be preyed upon on plantation. So the Union Army moves through and liberates an area, and some people stay and fight out the terms of their liberation there with their old owners or whatever. That's an interesting story. Some will get up and go. Some don't wait for the army to come. They go to them. Uh, you know, I, I read, I, I have the records of plantations in, near Charleston where the guy gets up, the owner gets up in the morning and half his 85 out of 160 of the people he thinks he owns are gone. Where? On a Union gunboat that they knew was coming up the river and they left. It's completely fascinating. Women and children, they used to tell us women didn't do this. Wrong. And then these guys sit down and make lists of the, the rebels on my plantation or the people who deserted me. And the first names on the list are, are women. Um, 
just because they got on a Union gunboat or made it to Port Royal, South Carolina to a Navy base doesn't mean they're safe. Um, so this is a horrible part of the story that just hasn't been written. It's as if every Black woman is glad to see an army come through. <laughs> really? No. So, you know, um, yes, there's a whole history of inhumanity on the, the, the part of the Confederate army for sure who murdered people just indiscriminately, but also sadly on the part of um, Union soldiers who, um, who have no respect for the people that they're so-called liberating. Lauren um, asked a question that will make this our, our last question. She says, you address this briefly in your book, but could you speak more directly to British common law and the law of coverture as an overarching organizing factor for American society into male and female spheres of influence and the inelasticity of these roles post-war, which she says is a disorganizing factor. What a great question. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, okay, basically one of the main arguments, I didn't want to go on tonight about arguments because people, you know, stories are more important than arguments, but one of the main arguments of the book is a part of the reason people dismiss women's history of war and politics is because they don't understand how fundamental marriage is and the family as an institution of political life. It is the foundational element of political life. All the political theorists says the family is the basis of the state and the state in society. Well, what's the basis of the family? Heterosexual marriage. Uh, we're still fighting those fights now. And what's the basis of marriage? <laughs> the role of husband and wife and the asymmetrical relations of husband and wife and the asymmetrical powers of husband and wife. This is, this is powerfully reproduced in Christian theology and in the, the everyday practice of religion, which is where I first really realized what was, could see it propagated and disseminated so that so that it's not it's not a it's, it's not something out there that's imposed on women from the moment they're born they're raised to assume it they're raised to believe it um and so of course african-american families and communities are organized very differently which is part of the reason they're seen as so unruly and problematic um but uh coverture uh is the legal mechanism for the law of what was called uh, up until the 20th century, I believe, the law of baron and femme, lord and woman. Um, and he had all kinds of rights. I mean, the family is like a little petty sovereignty, a little that, and that is how political theorists thought about it. It's a political, it's a little, it's a little sovereignty, man rules over that, over his household and his dependents. He represents them at the next level uh, of the polity, whether it's the republic or the democracy or whatever. Um, and the government really only wants to deal with those male heads of household. They, they, they don't have any relationship with um, women who are in the private sphere, men are in the public sphere. So all of these things, man and woman, public and private, work and like love, uh, motivated by money, motivated by sentiment. I mean, the, the gendering of all of these things runs fundamentally through um, American life and the coverture is the legal arrangements on which it's based. And as I said about Ella Thomas, even when it's broken down and married women have the right to their own property, it's no match for this instantiated sense of what a married Christian woman is. Um, and I think that's not irrelevant today either. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's huge. I mean, coverture, one of the most foremost feminist legal historians at Yale, Reva Siegel has says, coverture is not so much dismantled as remodeled. I think she might use that word. I'm not sure. It's it's like, it's modernized, but it's indispensable. And one of the things that just blows my mind, and that I think historians don't, male historians especially, don't grasp, is how impossible it is for at historical actors, men in power, to think about any future that doesn't reproduce that family structure and that asymmetry. They can't they can't do without the gender order. They just can't do without it. And I mean, we're still fighting fights about that, what role women have in the family, outside the family, um, in public culture. Um, but you can only imagine what this was like in the 19th century. So this is part of the reason that the um, enslaved people's history is so completely fascinating because 
they these things are not natural they're worked out in culture and in history so um you know there's different there's different ways of defining what a good wife is in one community than in another um and in fact the union army uh, one of its main missions during the war is to try to make black people get married and some do and some don't some say that ah, you know this isn't this isn't the way we do it. We're already uh, uh, recognized as a couple, um, so it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a huge part of the story. And I'm always, I think that male historians can't acknowledge it because they're still too invested in it. They can't historicize it. They can't see the edges of it. It doesn't. It's too natural for them. It's not. Um, it's not historical. I think. Why? Well, Power between men and women. I said at the beginning, I, I'm obsessed about power relations. And for me, yes, it's about class. Yes, it's about race for sure. But it's also fundamentally about power between men and women. And if you're interested in how, how power works historically, then you really ought to start with men and women. And too often it's not included at all, or it's an afterthought. People, people have a very difficult time thinking about it because they're too invested in it. They're too embedded in it. That would be my hypothesis. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay, so we just jumped to uh, thank you. This has just been wonderful, thought provoking, as Nora says. Um, I hope everyone will pick up the book and read it and continue thinking about these ideas and stories that uh, Stephanie McCurry has, has, has brought up. Again, it's a fabulously written book. And, and as you see, there's so much here to think about and uh, challenge some of the ways that that maybe we've thought before or validate some of the, the thoughts that we've had and help us to continue to learn about um, this this uh, you know transformative moment in in US history that we're still grappling with today as a uh, test shows you next week is the final program in our winter series Gretchen Soren's driving wild black African American travel and the road to civil rights on Thursday evening. Um, we have our current ex exhibition of three wonderful female artists, Philadelphia area artists um, who work with the Regional Digital Imaging Center. Come and see it. We're uh, open for viewing. I invite you to become a member if you want to continue to be a deeper part of this community of people who love to learn and engage together. Get our weekly thing. Uh, weekly weekly e-newsletter <laughs> to stay up to date on all of our new programs and if you have not yet received it you should receive in the mail very soon our spring uh, speaker series brochure um, so you, you can continue to sign up for programs including in april and may one month long programs with rick bell richard dr richard bell on um, ones on women in the american revolution the other slavery and the american revolution i don't remember which comes first and our Allegro presents music concerts, one in April, one in May, and one in June. Socially distanced, limited numbers, and live streamed. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Stephanie. We're so grateful uh, for you showing up even when you're under the weather and hope you're feeling well soon and look forward to continuing to engage with your scholarship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> that was that was fantastic. I Are appreciate we that. We're out of yes. the public. Great. Well, we have yeah, we have about twenty one people who are still on. Um, slowly getting it off. <sighs> Thank you for more.